Now, Sports Talk with Broads. Here's Hunter Brody. What is going on, everyone? Welcome on into Sports Talk with Broads. For the jerk offs out there that say baseball's not fun, baseball's boring, there's no thrilling moments in this game whatsoever. <laughs> You're just not watching the right ones. There's boring games all around the Super Bowl with the Patriots and the Rams. That sucked. There's plenty of boring NBA basketball games. There's boring games all around. But the beauty of sports, we just witnessed a moment where it was so damn exciting. You're fist pumping off your couch. You see spit flying just like you see right now flying out of my mouth. You're jumping up for joy when Alec Bohm puts it in play. And there's some bad throws going around and McCann can't actually make a play at home plate. That was absurd. That eighth inning was everything so special about baseball. And so was everything before that with Jacob deGrom. We might be witnessing the best pitcher in the history of the damn fucking game. That's how special he was. The four-seam fastball was dynamite. Talk about electric. It was on fire. And you couldn't catch up to it. What is so ridiculous about how powerful he really is is not the fact that it was 100, 101, 99.5, 99.7 all over the place, but that secondary pitch that he would throw in there occasionally, the fact that he can go two, three times through the lineup, and then by the third time, Reese Hoskins is still getting fooled, and Gene Segura doesn't know what to do with the off speed. It's the way that he demands his pitches, uses his pitches to fool every single batter in the history of the damn world. But knowing how the Mets normally do Mets, there was always this question mark in the back of all of our minds when watching the game. Are they going to get enough run support? And the fact that it was a two-run game... Look, you got to give credit to Kinsler who came in. The entire bullpen. The bullpen, the Phillies bullpen, actually held you into the game. Kinsler, amazing. Double play ball. Just great work out of him. Coonrod, perfection. Connor Brogdon, Mwah. And then Jose Alvarado, well, after the first two outs, things did get a little murky. But at the end of the day, Bryce Harper made the catch. And could he have made the original one? It was right by the edge of his glove as he was diving right there. Oh, could have, could have made that play? Maybe. I think on another night, Bryce Harper could have definitely dove and gotten that one. And then he don't get to the even uglier parts of the ninth inning is my point. But... It doesn't really matter. You were able to close it down, and you were able to hold on to the to the lead, and you were able to stay engaged into the game. Rojas made so many poor decisions, pulling DeGrom six innings, 77 pitches, when he couldn't get touched at all. It was ridiculous. Now, after the game, he said that DeGrom wanted to go out after the fifth, and then they both were satisfied after the sixth inning to go in another direction. But that that gives life to the Phillies. And the fact that there's fans in the stands too, everybody senses that. When DeGrom exits the game, everyone is fully aware that now everything has changed. Now you actually have a possibility of grinding through the pitchers, wear and tear, something that they have done through the first three games of the season. It's impossible to do that against DeGrom. So if you're one of those Phillies fans upset right now about the Phillies offense, and who knows, two months into the season, we can totally resurface this if they continue to be miserable for a long period of stretches. But if you're going to say they sucked against DeGrom, so now you're completely worried about things, everyone sucks against DeGrom. That four-seamer makes me shit my pants. It's so lethal. I've never seen anything like it. It's incredible. You're not going to do damage. You just won't. You got super close in the first inning when Reese Hoskins rips a bullet off the wall and where that mini fence is. It was so close. And with such a brutal mistake base running, he gets caught out at third. And there's two philosophies. You either stay at second because, hey, you get an opportunity to maybe knock in a run and you stay on second, or it's You're not going to get many chances. You are not going to get a lot of time on bases when DeGrom is on the bump. 
So let's try and go full throttle mode to third base. But ultimately, I would have rather stayed at second base and allowed Bryce Harper to try and get a nice little how do you do in that area. Before we dive more into this game, I do want to let everyone know that I am currently running a giveaway that ends on Wednesday. Every Wednesday, there's a new giveaway, but this Wednesday is a special one. It will end on Wednesday. I'm giving away a Bryce Harper jersey, and you have to be entered to win. It would be silly to not. So all you have to do is head over to my Twitter, at Broads81, and at the top of my profile, I have a pinned tweet where you have to retweet that tweet and follow me. It's that simple. The winner will be DM'd on Wednesday morning. So trust me, you will want to get involved in this Bryce Harper jersey giveaway. It would be nonsense to not do it. It is so simple. All right, so 77 pitches. Not only was he just doing it on the mound, but he was also swinging the stick. It was exactly like what you saw with Zach Wheeler in game two of the season, where he was able to apply his magic on both sides of the diamond. And I'm, I'm, I'm like pissed off watching him constantly go up to the dish and poke a ball. Like, what? Come on. DeGrom of all people. Matt Moore gives you three and a third, four hits, two earned runs, four walks, and four strikeouts. He started out great. It started out like a Cy Young winner striking out Lindor. Might have got a little lucky with some of the inside pitches and all, but still, you watch Lindor walk out to the dugout on his first at-bat in a New York Mets uniform in Citizens Bank Park, South Philadelphia, going crazy, going nuts, bringing the intensity. It's a beautiful thing to watch. He started to lose command, though, pretty damn early, and I'm not going to be satisfied with that, Adam Moore. There are some going with the philosophy of it's his first start, and... He had a first inning that was nice, and no, 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 no. Your four rotation starter has to give you more than three and a third. I'm sorry. He has to be better. Now, it wasn't perfect defense. I don't know what the hell Adam Hastley was doing out there, and you did see some misplays. Uh, there was a play, I think it was the fifth inning, so obviously he wasn't in there anymore, but Reese Hoskins tried to scoop a a ball that Didi Gregorius threw, and it wasn't a good throw. He was kind of on his back foot. Uh, But Reese Hoskins, that has been a common theme for him, not being the greatest in the world in that area. So there was some ugliness involved, but there was also, and I mentioned that Bryce Harper play in the ninth. I think Bryce Harper can realistically make that play. It didn't cost you there, but you probably could get that play out of Harper more times than not. Uh, With some of the wonkiness involved defensively, there were some good plays. Alec Boehm at third again. There's something to be said about. I think I'm starting to see some consistency in what he's doing very strong at at third base. It's those high balls. And it makes sense with his body frame being 6'5", the ability to jump, the ability to hop. He's timing his hops very well. I think the concerns will continue to lie when it's him charging a ball with a slow roller and he's got to pick it up in rhythm and throw the ball over to first. And some of that is a product of, as I alluded to with Reese Hoskins, I don't feel very comfortable in that area with Reese. So when Bohm does it, if you had a first baseman that was so confident in scooping the baseball and protecting the ball and making sure it doesn't get past you at all, I would probably have a different perspective on when Alec Bohm does it. I cringe a little heavier, not just because of Bohm, to be fair, because if I'm going to apply my defensive issues with Bohm and where I think there's going to be constant problems still, you know, I'm talking specifically him, not so much the other side, if you will. But, yeah, he did make a nice play there. And uh, Gene Segura at second base turned two very beautifully with Didi Gregorius as well. So there were some nice moments, but I, I didn't know what this team would be defensively, and I had a lot of worries entering the season And I think you started to see a little bit more of these issues in this game than you did in the first series against the Braves. I don't know what the hell Adam Hastley did. There's no way that was a product of the wind. I thought he just totally misjudged the ball, and he went way too back in the beginning of it, and he tried to make up for it by running full speed forward, and the ball dropped right in front of him. That's disgusting. That is putrid. All right, that is unacceptable. 
there's one thing that you probably should be able to rely on out of, out, out of, out of Adam Hazley, and it's the defensive side of the baseball. It's definitely not his production offensively. That eighth inning, as magical as it was, he started out with a strikeout, and then everybody else made it all occur, baby. Bamboo Brad on real, pokes it out, gets on first base, and this is where it all changed. It came down to Andrew McCutcheon and Reese Hoskins. And the at-bats that they put together is what I've been screaming about with this team since they started out this season. They will make you work. They will make you pay. You are going to have to battle if you're the opposing pitcher. Whether it's May, whether it's Aaron Loop, you are going to have a tough time from Reese Hoskins all the way through D.D. Gregorius. And when you look at what transpired in that eighth inning, it really went from Andrew McCutcheon through D.D. Gregorius. But they all had an impact on that five-run inning that changed the game. Now, as I mentioned, Rojas definitely had a tough day at the office. I also thought he overmanaged with Aaron Loop, knowing that there's three batter rule in play. Bryce Harper's up. Now, look, I'm, I'm not saying it's the easiest answer in the world, but you have someone who is very new and raw to managing baseball, and I think someone that has a little bit, although the three batter rule throws everything in for a loop, no pun intended. You could have 20 years of experience as a manager. No one has really been put through this type of misery where you have to keep a lefty out there for three batters. But my point is, with Bryce Harper up, and you didn't want to walk and run. It was bases loaded. So, yes, that matchup is extremely important, and you want to make sure you get someone out there that makes you feel comfortable. But after Bryce Harper, who he ends up hitting with the soft-ass pitch to make it a 2-1 game, you have Alec Bohm and JT Real Muto, or I guess JT Real Muto and then Alec Bohm, if we're going in order. Two right-handers. So was there any thought about what would happen after Bryce Harper? And I know that's the most important at-bat. That one right there because it's a 2 nothing game with bases loaded and you got to make sure you don't, what, throw up a righty where someone like Bryce Harper can just demolish a pitch and before you know it, it's a grand slam. So I don't think the easy answer is to say, oh, well, it's obvious. You just go with a righty because who cares about Bryce Harper? And then you just worry about JT and Alec Boehm because that's nonsense as well. But it just felt the way that he managed the game. He managed the game like a rookie, and I don't think he was even fully aware at all. I don't think he went to the second level thinking whatsoever and didn't even process that information at all. Oh, because there were other moments where maybe he could have intentionally walked someone or he could have um, pinch hit. There were so many things that I thought just from a managerial perspective, Rojas showed his true colors. And that doesn't mean he's going to be a failure in a flop forever. But for the Mets to Mets in game one, wow. So Reese and McCutcheon. Professional is, is almost an understatement, though, the way that they handle themselves up there. All right? If you get behind, who cares? Fine. We'll get behind. And then, Like Reese Hoskins, you get behind. All right. Who gives a damn? Who gives a damn? And then he works, and then he pokes it, and it's beautifully executed, and here we go. Here goes the rally. You just felt it. You could feel the flow. You could feel the excitement in the crowd. You just knew. Everybody knew. And even when they made the original change and they threw in Castro, JT Real Mucho on the first pitch. Now, this was prior. This was in that seventh inning. So, this was before all the scoring occurred. But when Castro came in and JT takes it to the warning track in one pitch, it's just the energy surrounding the entire game. When you make the move to pull out the Grom from this baseball game, everyone knows in the Phillies dugout, all right, fellas, let's attack. Let's do this. You change the game. You didn't have to do it. You said prior that the pitch count for DeGrom was 100 pitches. So why at 77 was at the time to make such a harsh decision? Think about DeGrom's career and how many times he posts a performance like that, which is jaw-dropping. 
Take away the Philadelphia Phillies. Take away the New York Mets. Take away the emotional tie to these teams. When I watched him go out there and just attack the strike zone and pretty much laugh, putting away hitters, knowing that no one will be able to touch anything that he does, I was admiring it like no other. I enjoy Aaron Nola. I enjoy Zach Wheeler. I love Zach Eflin. I've been enjoying this team starting pitching prior to tonight. And then when you see DeGrom, it almost puts it in perspective of, holy shit, these guys who are very talented, the players I just mentioned that are the top three in the Phillies rotation, they are extremely valuable. They are a fun watch night in and night out. But that really shows you exactly where Jacob DeGrom is. It's on another planet. And as much as Max Scherzer is one of my favorite competitors, when he has that face and he grunts, and when you hear him throw his pitches, you can tell that it's maximum capacity, full throttle, every pitch, just the way he exhausts his body, and he has to let all of it out, the force of letting everything come out. It's just amazing. And even a guy like Max Scherzer, it doesn't touch the ground. No one touches what he is able to do. I mean, he's utilizing two pitches. And the way that he, he he mixes it up. Fastball, 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 fastball. Secondary pitch. Secondary pitch. And then the next time around the lineup comes. Fastball, fastball, secondary pitch. Secondary pitch. Fastball, fastball. You just, you're lost. You're second guessing yourself. Reese Hoskins was absolutely fooled. And this isn't a knock on Reese. It's the power of DeGrom. Couple times through, I mean, he's getting buckled. You could see it in his facial expression. He's closing his eyes, kind of shaking his head as if, I don't know what to do anymore. Look around. What do you want me to do? I'd be looking in the stands. Yo, jerk off at 122. Who's booing me? What, uh, what do you want me to do? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. JT Real Mucho smacked one. Alec Bohm puts it in play. Didi Gregorius with the sack fly. They did it again without hitting a homer. Their only home run on the year so far is Andrew Knapp. I feel this is going to be a team that just finds a way to do it. Every night, it'll be something different. So the first couple of nights, what was it? Your starting pitching was on a tear. And then your hitting got the timely hits. Tonight, starting pitching was not there. The bullpen, though, showed its beautiful face. I can't stress enough what Kinsler and Kunra did. To hold it packed, hey, it's 2 nothing. We're going to make sure it stays 2 nothing. We will make sure our team is competitive and involved until the ninth. If we go down and lose 2 nothing, we go down fighting as a bullpen. We will not, I repeat, we will not allow them to to score another run. Now, they eventually did in the ninth, but you already had five runs in the eighth, so that's a different conversation. But making sure that when DeGrom gets yanked and when he's no longer in the game, your team was able to have the best possible chance because your bullpen did it not in one million years. Let me repeat this. Not in one million years would this team last year or the year before would have been able to pull this one out. All right, the 76ers, we saw a transition from years prior to this year. Big improvement, Joel Embiid and him becoming that guy. Also, coaching staff, Doc Rivers, Sam Cassell, Burke, the whole entire core, the front office changes. With this team, Dave Dombrowski, no more Matt Klintak, bringing in new guys. So the Seth Curry, the Danny Green, if we're just making that comparison, that's your Alvarado. That's your Coonrod. That's your Archie Bradley. That's your Connor Brogdon. Like, these are your guys that they're not your Joel Embiid's of the world, but they're your secondary pieces that play such a key, important piece to what this team is going to be. And I feel that there's this narrative around this squad in the clubhouse. It's time, fellas. I, it's time. We had this core of Reese and Bryce Harper for a couple years now. It is time to now put our foot on the gas and make a serious statement. It's time to take that leap. Right back to the 76ers. Growing pains, growing pains, losing. Very painful. It hurts. You're heartbroken. And then eventually you apply all of that feeling, all those emotional feelings. You apply it to your offseason. You apply it to your mentality. And then eventually you go out there and you 
and you apply it, and you become a totally different team that's ready to take that leap. This team right now, while we're four games in, there is this totally new smell that we are experiencing up our nostrils when they go out there with the Phillies pinstripes on and they hit the field. And uh, it, it's just crazy, man. It, it really is crazy. Alvarado, two outs. <laughs> and then it gets a little ugly with a couple hits. Of course, Conforto gets a hit. You're thinking there's always some of these Mets killers, or I should say the Phillies killers from the Mets. Talk about just a devastating loss. You're waiting for opening day after so many spring training games. You finally get there. There's a COVID problem where your game gets postponed. Then you got to wait. And then you feel, hey, we got the best matchup. We got the matchup we're looking for. DeGrom versus another team's four. Hey, this is a no-brainer. We all pretty much wrote it down as not so much a lock because I brought up the fact that Garrett Cole lost. And if you look through all the opening day games and you look through these big matchups where the pitching matchup was in favor of a certain squad, they ended up falling and there was great value on the opposition throughout DraftKings. And by the way, speaking of, this is a perfect time to say this, okay? It's everyone's favorite tournament of the year. The golfers are in Augusta, Georgia to compete for the coveted jacket. And DraftKings, America's top-rated sportsbook app, is putting you in the center of the action by giving you a shot to land in the green. This week, DraftKings is giving you 100 to 1 odds on the golfer of your choosing to finish in the top 10. If you haven't tried DraftKings, this is the time. Turning $1 into $100 is simple. Pick any golfer from this weekend's tournament, and if they cash in the top 10, you cash $100. Download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code BROACH when you sign up to turn $1 into $100 if the golfer of your choosing finishes in the top 10 of this weekend's tournament. That's code BROACH to turn $1 into $100 for a limited time. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older. New Jersey only. Nope. Must be 21 or older. Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply in partnership with Meadows Racetrack and Casino. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem. Call 1-800-GAMBLER. So, getting back to what I was saying before I was perfectly interrupted by mentioning DraftKings and telling you about their beautiful odds and promotions boosts that they have all the time. Promo code BROATS. It was set up for DeGrom, and we knew that going into it. We figured, hey, I mean, they clearly do have the advantage. To pretend like they don't, you are being naive. But it's still not impossible as long as they can get to the bullpen eventually. They lucked into getting to the bullpen based off of a poor decision, but it seemed to be a planned decision. And this goes back to a conversation I had on the last podcast where I was hearing people discuss that they're so mad about Aaron Nola getting yanked in the first game. And and, and I heard that people were disgusted with Joe Girardi. And it's not a Joe Girardi thing you're upset about. If you're mad about Aaron Nola getting pulled after six and two-thirds in the first game and it upsets you that Joe Girardi made that decision, that's not a Joe Girardi thing. It's a baseball thing. That's a baseball decision nowadays. It's game one. There's a reason why DeGrom didn't fight back. And when he had his jacket on his shoulder, taking his glove, putting his mask on, he looked cool as can be. He looked calm as can be. He wasn't upset about it. He wasn't pissed off. He wasn't disappointed. This is the nature of baseball. So that specific decision, well, yeah, I mean, Rojas probably. But my problem with that is they made it clear that 100 is the max capacity. So why 77? That's a lot different. If you didn't hear 100, then we don't really have that to relate it to. You don't really have it to look at and say, well, you didn't mention any. It's like, oh, okay, 77. That's probably the ballpark they were looking for, and they were okay with that and acknowledged it previously. But they acknowledged 100 previously, which changes this completely. All right, why don't we get to the Anytime Hotline right now to hear what you had to say about this incredible baseball game. Well, it got ugly. Especially in the night. But, you know, I'll take a win of how to get it, Rhodes. On to the next one. you you, you, you got to give this team a lot of credit for the, for the night. Fighting hard. Coming back. Even when nobody thought they would. And then the Mets decide to do this. 
You know, the way that this all transpired for the Mets, it's almost very similar to when we watched the Phillies lose the lead in two of the three games against the Braves. It could have been a disaster. It could have set the tone. You had the lead, Aaron Ola let the lead go. Zach Eflin had the lead, Zach Eflin let the lead go. So if you started the season off by being a product of what you were last year and the, all the conversation was your bullpen's better, you're a different team. If you just fix the bullpen, you could be a playoff squad. That's all we talked about. How Dave Dombrowski's impact of bringing in some of these veterans, how that was going to change everything. And if you're talking about day one, it all falling apart and looking exactly like it did last season. And then in game three, if the same thing happened again and you weren't able to complete the job and you fell in two games that you had, the lead where your bullpen wasn't able to hold on or well I guess technically it would have been both of your starting pitchers that weren't able to hand off the bullpen with the lead but still there there would have been a similar narrative that your bullpen in a tied game got shelled and got abused and the other team was able to score runs that's something that is a very common conversation that we had last season now when you're the Mets we always talk about the Mets being the Mets. And I said, give them a fair shot. Steve Cohen, Francisco Lindor, a whole new identity changes so much in sports. But for this, even if this isn't who they are, because I'm going to be honest with you, I don't think that they are still going to be that same exact team, even though tonight it did end up looking that way. There's so much baseball for them. It's the first game of the season. You're not going to be pulling DeGrom like this in his fourth start, in his fifth start, in his sixth start. And if they don't pull DeGrom, you're probably not winning this baseball game and you're going to get a loss. So as the games continue, like I don't, I don't think you get that same outcome. It does sting, though. I'm sure it has to be extremely painful and hurt all Mets fans' souls to witness it go down. How you've seen it go down in the last three, four, five seasons, that has been the Mets. So you're waiting for a change. You're waiting for a culture shift. You're waiting for this clubhouse to be a bit different. You have different leadership involved. And then on day one, it all goes downhill. But I guess you can relate this to... Also, with what happened with the Astros and you hire a manager that you wanted and then it's this whole debacle about being a part of some cheating scandal and now you got to go in another direction and then you hire a GM and the GM has some old scandals going on. I mean, internally, let's not act like this was the smoothest transition in the world as well. So is that something that can define the Mets still? Like, hey, they did switch some things, but... They're not totally clean. Uh, Steve Cohen, I think, was involved with some of that saga and drama that was happening with the with the stock market. I don't know. I'm not a big stock market guy, but there was some share stuff going on, and they put the stock market on hold because of the GameStop stuff. I think he was a factor in that. And I don't know. I mean, look, maybe they just have a dark cloud that's going to constantly sit around that franchise for more years, and I'm not going to be upset about it if that's the case. That's for damn sure. 4 no, let's go, bro. I love when I'm seeing from the Phillies. Now, I was all ready to come on here and just talk about the bullpen. Shame on me for thinking that we could actually get a clean save. But, hey, Alvarado wasn't pretty, but he got the job done. It hasn't been the cleanest four games so far, but 4 no, is 4 no. When we couldn't hit the ground, that was expected. You get to the Mets bullpen, as long as it's not Edwin Diaz, we're attacking them. Yeah, the cool clean thing, is it clean, is it not clean? It's too early to worry about that. Start out hot. Get on a nice, beautiful run early. Because, look, there's going to be a time where they might dip. And there might be a couple series where they win one of two, one of two, one of two. And they can't find their groove. Maybe three series in a row. Maybe they get swept one series. Then they go one and two, one and two. Like, there, there's going to be. That's any, any team. World Series teams, they lose in a series in the regular season. There's going to be a hiccup along the way. But if you set yourself up because... You start out 10 and 2 or 14 and 4. And so then when it's like, okay, you might dip a little bit, you put yourself in such an advantage early that not that you allow yourself to do it, but it's inevitable that you are going to go through a little bit of a funk. You're going to have your best hitters maybe not seeing the ball so well. You might get a little sloppy. Maybe your starting pitching doesn't go as strong. Maybe you get a three game stretch of. Nola, Wheeler, Eflin, where all three of them struggle a bit, and then your your bullpen's impacted, and then Matt Moore and Chase Anderson need bullpen help, but because they needed to be utilized so heavily with your first three starters. You know what I'm trying to say, though? You, you kind of understand the flow on where we're going here. So, 
Uh, not the prettiest, not the smoothest. It doesn't matter. Like, this is how baseball is played. This is the beauty of baseball. On any given night, something wild can happen, and you squeak out a win, and it is what it is. I thought, not that I, I, I do not think the Phillies deserve to win, but after that pool, they took it. They took it. They did. It wasn't as if it was handed to them on a silver platter. Like, hey, here you go. Hey, have it. There was a little bit of it, but you also had to execute. Uh, like, uh, they technically did have it handed to them when they pulled DeGrom because it gave them life, but there is a second part to it. That was part one. You needed part one to happen, but when it did happen, there was a part two that needed to be accomplished. They accomplished it because of their, I love it. I love the fact that, because even on leading off with Broads, and if you don't know what leading off with Broads is, one hour before Phillies baseball games, I have a pregame live show that's on YouTube, Twitch, and my Twitter account, at Broads81, where I lead you into Phillies baseball. We have some fun conversations. We got five major topics. We hit on those topics. And one of those was, will the Phillies pitching, will they be able to grind out the Grom? And no, they weren't necessarily able to do it to him, but they were able to do it to everybody else involved. But I specifically mention Reese Hoskins through Didi Gregorius. There is something about that. Let it sink in into your brain. There is something from your two to your six that teams are going to have a really hard time trying to figure out. Because when do you have the chance to just take a deep breath? You do not. If Reese Hoskins is in his best stretch, he's still going to work you. It'll still impact everything. And speaking of impact, though, you did use a lot of guys. So let's hope to get a little bit more out of Chase Anderson tomorrow. I did like looking at a lefty, though, really, in a Phillies uniform, a lefty to start the game. I was like, whoa, almost taken back a bit. It was something new. It was something fresh. I I do need to see him more out of... Chase Sanderson, though, uh, like someone mentioned in that leading off with Broad's chat about Matt Moore's stat line, and it was something along the lines of, what if he gives you five and a third, five and two thirds, two earned runs, five hits in that category? I would have been I would have been okay with that, and I acknowledged it at the time before the game even started. If you got five and two thirds out of Matt Moore, five and a third, I'm absolutely satisfied. Three and a third, though, not so much. He did have some nice strikeouts early, but once he started walking pit or once he started walking batters excuse me, things totally went into a spiral and you had to bring Kinsler in and uh, you got a nice double play ball and all involved. It was stopping the bleeding. You stopped the bleeding. Brad. Brad. Brad, did you see that? Wow. The Phillies 4-0, baby. After going down 2 nothing, Come back 5-2 win. What a game. What a comeback. 4-0. The Mets stink. And I am excited. Let's go, Phillies. I'm excited, too. Just the favor for this game, just the fact that all day long I'm looking at my phone. Is it 5 o'clock yet? Is it 6 o'clock yet? Is it 7 o'clock yet? I needed to sit down, and it's so nice to just put your feet up. Now, tonight was a triple TV night. Because you had the Flyers on. They played the Bruins. They won in overtime. You had the National Championship on as well. But Phillies baseball was full TV, big TV, big screen, 75-inch the whole time. I forgot how much I, I truly missed it, which is saying a lot considering I knew that there was desire. for Like, I, I, I had to have it back. And the fact that I'm still this overwhelmed with joy and having this much of a smile on my face, the feeling... Uh, it's been a while. I'm going to be honest with you. It's been a while where I went full throttle, jump up off the couch screaming to the point where you get a text from the fiance. Hey, what's going on down there? You are right down there. Hey, what's 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 going on? You know, like, hey, shut up. <laughs> All right, you're making the dog bark. You're going to wake up the neighborhood. It's been a while since that has happened. When I watch the Flyers, when I watch the Sixers, I- I'm not, like, going wild. When that eighth inning went down, and I saw JT Real Muto, specifically JT Real Muto's one, because Bryce Harper gets hit by a pitch. You give a couple claps. All right. All right. And you see Bryce Harper look over at JT, like, give him a come on. When JT delivered, it was a, it was a, let's fucking go. One of those. It was a full on, let go, let's go. It was a full on arm pump, arm fist punch concept and doing that right now I think I might have pulled it out of its sock it was probably a horrendous idea 
Uh, but I'm I'm here for it. I do it any day of the week for this Phillies team to continue to grab victories and get in that wing column. But God damn, that hurt. Whoo, whoo. And speaking of the the reaction, by the way, of Bryce Harper and JT, or was it no? It was Bryce Harper, Reese Hoskins, after they scored on that wild play where McCann can't make the play at home, and there's the defensive replacement that all went down. Weird, just so weird. To see them two jump up in slow motion, push one another. There's an energy. There definitely is. Well, what a comeback for the Phillies. Beating the Mets 5-3. to three, Their fourth straight win of the season. We keep this up. We can win the division. Maybe win the World Series. Let's go, Phil. Oh, no. You had to throw the World Series in there? As pumped up as I am. I'm just not ready for that. I'm really not. I don't think I want to go through the discussion of division winning, World Series winning, bros, can they make the playoffs? Bros, how deep can they go? How 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 long can they keep this up? Like, enjoy it. Just enjoy it. And I'm a big picture guy. You know that. Specifically more in the NBA, but that's different. An NBA team, you know if they're an NBA championship caliber team or not. With baseball... It's 162. You win your first four games and you look this way. It doesn't necessarily always relate. I see things that can relate. I see things that do relate to winning baseball. And I'm more excited than I ever have been because of this new identity of the front office and how that has really trickled down all the way through the clubhouse from, believe it or not, John Middleton making the decision to go to Dave Dombrowski, allowing him to make the decisions and and spend a lot of money to bring Didi and JT Real Muto back. Just Dave Dombrowski being here, the way he speaks about the game and his pedigree to Joe Girardi, to Bryce Harper, to everybody else, everyone else, it's there. Uh, But in terms of like, hey, what can we do now? And can we make the playoffs now? Just relax, 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 relax. Let's have fun. Let's react by the games. But know that 162 is insane. It is a long journey where it's not ready to be described fully yet of what this team is. So let's not get too ahead of ourselves. There is so much that can go down. And, yeah, so I I think I'll end the podcast here. So before we head out of here, let me tell you about my friends over at Simone Jewelers. I went to them for my fiancé's engagement ring, and it definitely was the best decision of my life. I went back and got her an outstanding necklace for her birthday and for other holidays, earrings, you name it. Definitely one of the greatest decisions in my life. And I made so many great decisions. There's no doubt about that. Like proposing to my fiance, of course. DeSimone Jewelers is a family-owned business with over 40 years of experience. Moved from Jewelers Row to Haddonfield, New Jersey. They do not use sale tactics. They just show you their options and they educate their customers and they treat their customers like family. They customize and manufacture every ring they make from start to finish. And because of that, they beat competitors' prices. I've sent so many family members in their direction. I get the same response back, Broads. They're incredible. You'll know exactly what I mean when you go in there and say, Broads sent me. More information is down below. Thank you all so much for listening, and I will see you next time.